let's get started welcome everyone and thank you for being here this afternoon i'm especially grateful to kristen mugford senior associate dean for culture and community tarik masood faculty director of the kennedy schools middle east initiative and terrell drake in our office of diversity equity and inclusion their collective efforts made this event possible I'm also grateful to all of today's panelists for joining us, some of whom specially came from cities outside Boston to be with us and sharing their expertise and perspective. I'm very pleased this discussion is occurring. The last few months have been difficult for Harvard Business School and for Harvard, for many, the attacks on 10-7 and the war in Gaza afterwards, and the recent tragedies facing the Israeli and Palestinian people have been felt deeply and viscerally. For everyone, the history is complex and the issues are complicated. Today's discussion is about educating ourselves on these issues. Because in the words of one of today's panelists, Dean Amani Jamal, this is where universities can play a unique role. They can, as she wrote in a recent co-authored New York Times op-ed, and I quote, state hard truths and clarify critical issues. They must train the leaders of tomorrow to think creatively and boldly. Countering speech that is harmful, modeling civil dialogue, mutual respect and empathy, and showing an ability to listen to one another." End of quote. So it is listening, what I call active listening, that I want to encourage you to do today. Approach this conversation with open-mindedness and a commitment to empathy and learning. Absorbing multiple points of view, particularly those that are different from your own, is the best way to begin to navigate uncertainties and deepen understanding. I expect you will hear things with which you disagree this afternoon. I urge you to look at these moments as I do, as a gift, an opportunity to learn about a different perspective and to challenge assumptions and preconceptions. With that, let me ask Kristen to kick things off for us today and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Srikant. Let me echo the welcome from Dean Tatar, both to members of the HBS community and to the members from across Harvard who are joining us here today. We appreciate you making the cold walk across the river. For those of you who are less familiar with HBS, our mission to educate leaders who make a difference in the world requires three things. An environment of trust and mutual respect, free expression and inquiry, and a commitment to truth excellence, and lifelong learning. Today's panel is a terrific example of all three. I also want to remind all of our guests of our HBS community values, which we expect everyone in this audience to uphold. That is respect for the rights, differences, and dignity of others, honesty and integrity, and accountability for personal behavior. We ask that you refrain from any interruption in order to allow everyone to get the opportunity to learn from our esteemed panelists. In that spirit, we also ask you to please silence your phones. Our moderator today is Tarek Masood, the Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Governance at the Harvard Kennedy School and Faculty Director of the Harvard Kennedy School Middle East Initiative. We are so grateful for his friendship and partnership in bringing together this esteemed panel. Please join me in welcoming Professor Masood and our guests. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you, uh, Dean Dittar and, and Dean Mugford, for welcoming me. I'm a humble faculty member from a rather downmarket neighborhood uh, across the river. Um, and it's really quite extraordinary to be here at the business school in this beautiful venue, uh, Clarman Hall. I, I want to start with a little bit of a confession, which is that um, I um, am sitting here and um, with these very notable people in this uh, very uh, beautiful space, and I'm looking out on all of you who've gathered here uh, to listen to what we have to say. And... Um, it fills me with a bit of a sense of guilt. And that sense of guilt is because I know that I'm in this beautiful space and that we're able to capture the attentions of this bright uh, and beautiful audience uh, because of enormous suffering, enormous human suffering in a part of the world that I and my co-panelists happen to study. We're here because of dead civilians, Jewish and Arab, the former massacred in acts of terror that were shocking in their lurid intimacy, and the latter massacred in retaliations that are shocking in their scale. Every single one of us on this panel wishes that we actually didn't have to be here tonight for this particular reason, and that the world no longer had any need for this particularly grim bit of our collective expertise. But we hope to echo what Dean Dittar said, that by sharing our expertise, we can help you, uh, our audience, concerned citizens, future leaders of America, after all, you are all Harvard people, um, to make sense of this conflict and to become, indeed, part of the solution. We have with us a very distinguished panel whose deep knowledge of the region and of this particular crisis is matched by their humanity and their empathy with all of the peoples caught up in it. The question we've asked them to grapple with today are the questions with which we've titled this event. How did we get here and where are we heading? They have a range of views on this question. Indeed, I might even say they disagree on the answers to these questions. But tonight's panel isn't a debate. They're not here to score points for this or that team. They're here to help us arrive at a fuller understanding of a situation that should command all of our attentions. What we're looking for tonight is not, in the words of the poet, the day of judgment, but the day of understanding. To help us achieve that understanding, we first have uh, uh, Professor Emani Jamal, the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Princeton University, and the Edward Sanford Professor in its Department of Political Science. Dean Jamal is uh, not just a leader of one of our finest institutions of higher learning. As a Kennedy School professor, I might say, in fact, that she's the Dean of the second best school of public affairs. Um, um, but she is also a pathbreaking scholar of politics whose work documenting and explaining the structure of public opinion in the Arab world and in Palestine has influenced legions of scholars, uh, your humble moderator included. She's the author of two very important books, one on civil society in Palestine, the other on anti-Americanism in the Middle East, and she's written several very important articles. She has won every distinction and award that you can win in our field and was recently named a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We're thrilled to have her here today. The next person I want to introduce is uh, David Makovsky, who's the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the director of the Koret Project on Arab-Israel Relations. Mr. Makovsky is somebody who I would describe as having consecrated his life to helping us understand the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. He spent most of that uh, career, the early part of his career, as a journalist writing for such places as the Jerusalem Post, Haaretz, which is one of Israel's leading dailies and U.S. News and World Report. In fact, I first met Mr. Makovsky when I was a, in my early 20s. I was a segment producer on a PBS uh, uh, 
uh, a, a news program in the waning uh, uh, years of the last uh, millennium, and he was a frequent uh, guest on that uh, show, and one of the few people who was nice to me and treated me like a human being, so I never forgot it. Um, in 2013, 2014, he went from writing about the conflict to trying to help solve it. Uh, he served as senior advisor to the U.S. State Department's special envoy for uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. He has received numerous awards for his work, perhaps none more important or noble than a master's degree for, in Middle Eastern studies uh, that was bestowed upon him from this fine institution, not the business school, other part of Harvard. Uh, and he's the author most recently of Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny, which he wrote with Dennis Ross. We're thrilled to have him today. Uh, next, we have Dr. Khalil Shikaki, who is the director of the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah in the West uh, Bank, and a senior fellow at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Dr. Shikaki earned his doctorate in political science from Columbia. He has had numerous professorships in his uh, native Palestine, including serving as Dean of Scientific Research at one of Palestine's most notable universities, Al Najah University in Nablus and the West Bank. And since 1993, he has conducted more than 200 polls among Palestinians in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. If you've ever read a data point uh, purporting to explain Palestinian public opinion, and you thought that this data point was very insightful, you thought that the underlying survey was well executed, odds are that that is the handiwork of Dr. Khalil Shikaki. He is the author of numerous research works, including Palestinian and Israeli Public Opinion with Jacob Shamir, Strengthening Palestinian Public Institutions with Yazid Sayed, and a book called Arabs and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East, which is probably the best textbook on the Arab-Israeli crisis that you can find. And it was written with our next panelist, uh, and that is Professor Shai Feldman. Before I introduce Shai Feldman, I just want to make sure Khalil gets his applause as well. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize my elegant transition was going to do that. Okay, so Shai Feldman is uh, a, a dear friend and the Raymond Frankel Professor of Israeli Politics and Society at Brandeis University. He's a graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the University of California and Berkeley. And what Shai Feldman has forgotten about the Israel-Palestine conflict, I have not yet learned. Uh, he is one of our most prolific and insightful scholars of Middle Eastern politics and, ge and security uh, more broadly, and he's also a tremendous institution builder. So he is the founding director of the Crown Center for Middle East, uh, politic, uh, Middle East Studies at Brandeis, which really is one of the very best and most vibrant and dynamic fora for cutting edge thinking about the Middle East. Before building the Crown Center, he headed the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University, and after heading the Crown Center from 2019 to 2022, he was the president of Sapir Academic College in uh, southern Israel, actually near one of the places that was targeted in Hamas's October 7th operation. He's written numerous books, and he is absolutely the first person I look to when I try to make sense of events in Israel which perhaps explains why I never host a discussion on this issue without having him. So please join me in thanking and welcoming Shah. Okay. So, so, so uh, tonight's panel will proceed uh, as follows. First, I'm gonna try to engage our panelists in conversation on the twin questions that bring us together this evening. How did we get here and where do we go from here? And then uh, I'm going to turn to you, our uh, brilliant and uh, uh, insightful audience, to ask your own questions of our distinguished panel. But, so first, let me just start with how did we get here? And I, I guess I'll, I'll start with you, uh, uh, Dean Jamal, you know, one of the things um, about this, uh, the time that we're having this panel is that we've all, we all come here having heard 
explanations about what happened on October 7th. We've all, we come here having heard many arguments and counter-arguments, narratives and counter-narratives, accounts and opposing accounts. And I thought I would start by trying to get a, our panel to help us pick through some of these accounts to figure out um, uh, how we can come to our own considered view of the events of October 7th and what uh, has come since. So, there can't be any reasonable disagreement about that what happened on October 7th was deeply inhuman and unjustifiable. But there's a lot of disagreement about why it happened. So no disagreement that, or there shouldn't be any reasonable disagreement about what happened, but there's disagreement about why it happened. I was listening to the um, podcaster Sam Harris the other day, and Sam Harris said, look, this is very simple. You know, people like, uh, who have PhDs overly complicate it. What we observed on October 7th, these atrocities were the direct and straightforward result of a radical uh, jihadist ideology, okay? Now, others, you know, who aren't seeking to justify what happened will say, well, that's overly simplistic, and that really what happened is a straightforward result of 16 years of siege of Gaza and 56 years of occupation. So we have these two narratives. How do we figure out which of them is right, or are they both wrong? Right, uh, so thank you so much for that, Tarek. And I want to also thank the dean and, and you for organizing this wonderful, wonderful event. I want to thank all of you for turning out. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and discussion. So, you know, I, don't, I think we don't want to oversimplify on, other, on either side, right? Um, so let's just look at what, what was the status of the conflict before October 7th, right? So you have the Gaza Strip. It's been under siege for 16 years. We know that the living conditions in Gaza are very extraordinarily difficult. In, uh, we were surveying, uh, Khalil is our partner on the Arab Barometer, we were surveying in, in the West Bank and Gaza right before October 7th. And literally what we found about within that three week period before October 7th is that 75% of Gazans said that they couldn't afford to feed their families in the 30 days before, in, in the last month. So that's three out of every four Gazans basically struggling to, meet, to feed their children. Gaza is a, a densely populated area. It is locked. Um, it does not control its water, does not control its electricity, it does not control its Wi-Fi. The entire strip is controlled by Israel, more or less. It also relies on about anywhere between three to 400 trucks of aid per day. So when we hear that 20 trucks of aid were entered into Gaza through Rafah as an accomplishment in this crisis, it's not even scratching the surface in terms of the actual need there. So under good conditions, daily life in Gaza is unbearable. This has been documented year in and year out uh, by the human rights organizations, by Palestinians themselves, by journalists who are in Gaza. So, for us who've studied this conflict for 20 years, if you sort of just look at the, the, the trend line, every three to five years we see bubbling up in Gaza, Be just because of the, 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 the conditions of Gaza. What we haven't seen is October 7th, the atrocities linked to October 7th. Um, and you know, why did this happen? Why did they go deep into, why did Hamas go deep into Israel? Why did they, you know, quote unquote, overreach in this extent of, if this was a military campaign, why bring in the civilians? Things that we haven't seen before, that's all we can sort of bracket that because we, mm. we don't want to sort of assign uh, assumptions there. Um, nevertheless, if we're sort of asking about the condition of Gaza and the bubbling of Gaza, this has been a trend, um, mm -hmm. an ongoing trend. Yeah. D David, you know, I mean, am, am I wrong in, in thinking that these are the two narratives that seem to be competing for attention in the kind of wider, uh, uh, you know, public opinion sphere? And, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Dean Jamal points out that they're both kind of wrong. So what, what is the right account? Well, look, I, the way I read your question, <laughs> I want to also add my thanks to you, Tarek, for putting it together, to the deans of Harvard for having all of us, getting to see old friends and only new friends. Um, 
So thank you all. Thank everyone for coming. I hope you can hear me in the back okay. Uh, great, cool. Um, look, I, I read your, I don't see what happened on October 7th as, a, as an intifada, a mass uprising. Uh, there's a whole context of the history, which I'm sure we can get into, you know, is, you know, I wrote a book on Oslo. Uh, the first thing they agreed on was Israel wants to get out of Gaza. You know, 1994, turn it over to the Palestinian Authority, 2005, pull out all the settlers, uh, which for Israel was a big deal uh, to do that. And people thought, okay, if you don't occupy them, then they might not love you, but okay, but at least you're, you're moving on. I think 2007, when Hamas really took over, was a watershed. And here maybe we might have some slight differences of cause and effect because the so-called blockade was a focus on Hamas saying, we're going to still fire rockets at you. And that's what led to what it did. Now, we'll talk about the, the economic assumptions, I hope, in, in some of the other questions. I don't want to get bogged down. But I, I would say, I think what's important for people to understand, this was a deliberate decision-making by the Hamas leadership to do this atrocities. The people of Gaza did not commit these atrocities, not as a mass movement. It was a determined set of few at the top uh, who 2,000 people, whatever that number is, that did these atrocities. And in my view, they were driven by two big ideas, as I see it. Uh, one big idea was a belief that Israel, that there could be an access of resistance of all sorts of Islamist militias loosely affiliated on different levels, not necessarily proxies, some are proxies, I wouldn't call Hamas a proxy, of Iran, and who thought that this was a moment of ultimate weakness inside Israel. I look at Khalil, who I adore, and I second, I, the best pollster, hands down, on Palestinian politics. And every trip to Ramallah, my first stop, Khalil. Um, I, you know, the, the key here is understanding, in his poll in, in September, I think it is, he said 44% of Gazans think Israel is weak and uh, fragmented and on the verge of collapse. I think that's a direct quote. Why did they think so necessarily in 2003, uh, 2023? Because of the divisions over the judicial overhaul issue. Right. You had pilots who said they wouldn't serve in reserve duty, special forces, soldiers. If I was an Arab looking inside Israel, I would say, if, well, if there's ever going to be a, an attack, it's going to be in 2023 because of this sense of fragmentation. Now, in, in my view, it was a terrible misreading, a terrible miscalculation, because Israel will unite in a time of crisis, as it is done. But also the poll in Israel Democracy Institute, 70 percent of Israelis interpret what happened mm. here as a sense of the timing. We're talking about the timing now. Why now? was because of a sense of, a, of an interpretation of Israeli weakness. If you look at Mohammed Def, uh, the Hamas commander, what he says the day of the 7th, this is the time for all the axis of resistance to join the fight. He said that in an audio message. On October 15th, uh, Abu Marzouk, uh, and Khalid Mashal goes on television and says, basically, Hezbollah, what you've done is nice, but not enough. The battle requires more. There's a sense of, of disdain that here we're doing it. We're, where is everybody? We thought mm -hmm. we were doing it for the whole axis and none of you guys are showing up. Yeah. So that's, I think, reason one. The second reason I would yeah. give that I see, and everyone I know I talk to in the Arab world, Israel, the White House, the State Department, they all believe this, um, is that this was an effort to thwart uh, a, a mega deal of the United States led by the Biden administration with Saudi Arabia, which would be what I call a mega deal, a U.S.-Saudi defense treaty, mm -hmm. but part of that deal to get two-thirds of the Senate for a, an actual treaty, which requires two-thirds, was a Saudi-Israeli normalization. Now, if you're a rejectionist group like Hamas, you might say, if the Saudis make peace with Israel, now that Egypt has done it, Jordan has done it, the United Arab Emirates has done it, there's also been other countries, Morocco, Bahrain, but those are the key ones. If Saudi does it, it's game over. Yeah. And so I think part of it was to thwart it, maybe to, to trigger a big retaliation that would be seen on every Arab television screen in Saudi Arabia and in the Arab world. So I think to me, when you say, why now? Why is the timing now? I would say this was a deliberate decision of Hamas, uh, looking both internally inside Israel 
and looking at the Biden administration's priorities for a major regional initiative that was going to be its signature yeah. policy uh, and, and going on now in the coming months. Okay, so so th that that's that's very helpful in ter terms of trying to understand Hamas's decision making at this particular moment. I, I kind of think that my question is a little bit, maybe even a little bit more basic than that. Where I'm trying to understand is, is if the state that this conflict is in right now was inevitable, right? Because both of these narratives kind of suggest, one of them suggests that as long as you have Hamas, this is the kind of thing that will happen because it is just hell-bent on uh, uh, you know, I I killing Jews or uh, eliminating the state of Israel. And then there's another account that's basically saying, actually, the whole reason that Hamas is behaving this way, the whole reason that we're in, a, in the situation that we're in is because of a set of policies over the last 16, over the last 50 years, whatever, that, um, you know, not just immiserate Palestinians, as uh, Professor Jamal has pointed out, but maybe even undermine moderates and uh, uh, allow uh, 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 radicals like Hamas to, to get the upper hand. So I guess that's the question I'm tr I, I think our, lots of people who are reading this, lots of my students, these are the accounts that they're trying to grapple with. Khalil Shikaki, can you help us, you know, adjudicate between them? Sure, I can try. <laughs> I think there are three questions here. One is the overall environment. Was this overall environment leading in this direction or not. The second is the Hamas decision making. Uh, and the third is the timing. These are three separate issues, but perhaps the most fundamental is the first. I'll quote the Jordanian for a minister who said Hamas did not invent the conflict. The conflict invented Hamas. In the last, since the Oslo process started, um, we have seen Israelis and Palestinians trying to reach an end to the conflict, a two-state solution. Um, the current Israeli government, led by Netanyahu, is the same government that has been try trying for most of the last 16 years to create conditions or to support conditions that have essentially prevented any progress in that direction. Hamas was very instrumental in providing that kind of environment. Uh, the Palestinian division means there is no serious discussion about a two-state solution or ending the conflict. And so Israel and Hamas found themselves in the same bed for the last 16 years. Hamas has been nourished by this logic, the logic of how to prevent a two-state solution from coming about. That is why Hamas became stronger and stronger, because the Netanyahu governments have done their best to make sure that the Palestinians remain divided and that there is no serious discuss discussion about ending the Israeli occupation. This is the source of all evil in this whole story, that there is occupation that we are not able to get rid of and the Palestinians want to get rid of that. But then there is Hamas decision making. The Hamas decision making cannot be read without looking at the history of these 16 years. What has Hamas been trying to do during these 16 years? We can't just look at what Hamas is saying today, as you have done, David, as, as an explanation for their behavior. We have already 16 years of their control of Ga over Gaza in which we can see what direction they have been uh, trying to find a solution to their own predicament. They have been in Gaza since 2007, controlling Gaza. They took over Gaza violently from the Palestinian Authority. But since then, they've been trying to figure out a way out, an exit for them out of the predicament they put themselves in. And the initial impulse was to have a mini state in Gaza of their own for the time being, and that that state of a mini state would have access through Egypt. This is why they had hundreds of tunnels underneath Egypt, underneath the Gaza Egypt borders, so that they can have a kind of political economy that can sustain that kind of outcome. A mini state in Gaza. That's what they have done between 2007 and 2014. 
In 2014, with Sisi in power, Sisi closed down 99% of the tunnels that the previous regime or regimes allowed in place. With that completely destroyed, the idea of a mini state was destroyed. And the Hamas started to look for an alternative strategy. The alternative exit for them was through the, going back to the Palestinian Authority, allowing the reunification of the West Bank and Gaza. And now we have a period between 2014 all the way until 2021 with new Hamas leaderships uh, that have in fact done everything in its power to give the Palestinian Authority everything the Palestinian Authority asked for so that the West Bank and Gaza can be reunified. Sinwar, the man who led this last offensive, is the man who gave Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, everything that, 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 that Abbas wanted so that he could reunify the West Bank and Gaza. And Abbas failed. In April 2021, Abbas canceled the elections that were Sinwar's hmm. means of getting to the reunification so that Hamas can be reintegrated once again into the Palestinian formal political process. That was Sinwar's way out. That was different from those who actually carried out the violent takeover of Gaza, whose goal was a mini state in Gaza mm. through Egypt. Ha ha Abbas destroyed that option. Hmm. So, uh, CC destroyed the first, and it was Abbas who destroyed the second. Hmm. Between 2021, all the way until October the 6th, Sinwar's eyes looked at Netanyahu and Israel. And not just Netanyahu, but also the two previous prime minister before Netanyahu, Lapid and Bennett, for a third exit. And the third exit was to go back to the idea of a mini state that now Hamas has come to the conclusion that Abbas cannot be trusted and he is not going to allow the reunification of the West Bank and Gaza. They have to have their own mini state in Gaza. But instead of Egypt being the exit, mm. Netanyahu and Israel became the exit. That Israel would offer them an end to the siege and blockade in, in return for allowing Hamas to control Gaza and maintain security for Gazans and for Israelis. That's the, this is the deal that previous Israeli government have been trying to reach with Hamas that I think have gained significant grounds uh, starting with late 21. With the formation of the most extreme Israeli government early this year, Sinwar's goal of reaching a mini state in Gaza was completely demolished and he now was left without any way out. The most difficult part for the Israeli government was how to give Sinwar yeah. the legitimation needed to be able to have a mini state in Gaza. And that legitimation was a huge success in releasing Palestinian prisoners. The issue of Palestinian prisoners has been the most fundamental issue of legitimacy for any Palestinian leader. That's what Sinwar wanted. He could not get that with the kind of prisoners he had before yeah. Yeah. October 7. The plan for Sinwar, the offensive, was to achieve many things, but most importantly, to hurt Israel, to force it to come to the negotiating table, to have enough prisoners so that he can have a huge success in releasing prisoners so that the West Bank will give him legitimacy to have a mini state in Gaza. Gazans wanted a mini state. West Bankers rejected it completely. Having that kind of success would have given Sunwar what he wanted. The timing was affected by the Saudi deal. He did not want the Saudis and the Israelis to reach a deal, leaving him hanging in limbo. Yeah. He was influenced by what was happening in Israel, the judiciary, he was influenced by was what, what was happening in the West Bank, the rise of armed groups, because Israel was sending its army to the yes. West Bank rather than defending its own borders Border in Gaza. Gaza. Yes. That is the timing, but it has nothing to do with the fundamental goals of what Hamas has been trying to do for 16 years. So that, that's really uh, 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 very uh, important because you've offered a narrative 
of Hamas basically as a rational actor whose goal is to try to set up a, a, a mini state in Gaza and having the door slammed shut Israel by the Egyptians. Israel treated it exactly like yeah. that yeah. for 16 years. This is not a new narrative. Yeah. This is how Israel dealt with Hamas for 16 years. Yeah. Shai, is that, uh, do you sign on to the uh, uh, narrative uh, or the analysis offered by your co-author? <clears throat> you put me on the spot here. <laughs> So first of all, I, would, I, I, I want to say this. I think that uh, we, we, have to, we have to differentiate between general conditions that, uh, that allow a development to take place and the specific circumstances that affect the timing. And they're not the same. Right. On, on the, I think that... Uh, Put it this way. Is Israel's position on Hamas is, and, and, and by the way, I could proceed everything I say by saying I agree with my first three panelists. Um, I think every one of them uh, had a piece of the truth. But the problem is that this is a very complex story. And it's not very easy to, to basically... Um, identify which parts are, or at least which parts I agree with and which, uh, which not. I think that um, you, you, it goes back to your, to your first two narratives. There is no, you cannot look at this without uh, giving at least some weight to the fact that Israel was dealing with a neighbor that ideologically was committed to Israel's destruction. And it never changed its narrative. It's not the PLO. The PLO gradually from 1974 through the phase plan to 1988, the Declaration of Independence, then Oslo, it gradually changed its narrative. And it made the, the relationship between the Palestinians led by the PLO and Israel no longer a zero-sum game. The, 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 um, Hamas has never gone through this same journey. And the problem is that, 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 that Israel weighed then all these issues regarding, for example, the so-called siege. Israel weighed this issue of siege through this prism of the fact that it landed with a neighbor, and I'll get to whether that neighbor also played, uh, was, was a convenient tool. <laughs> for a certain uh, narrative in Israel, but a neighbor that was committed to Israel's destruction. So the, some, of the, some, of the, some of the things that Israel accepted when it dealt with the PLO, in 1998, President Clinton came to Gaza and inaugurated an international airport in the beginning of a port in Gaza, okay? The minute that Hamas took over, and we have to remember, this is somehow a plurality of Palestinians, somehow a plurality of Palestinians voted for Hamas in the 2006 elections. And then the same Hamas took over Gaza Strip violently from the PA. Israel handed the, the Gaza Strip to the PLO in the framework of the Oslo Accords. Okay? Now it faced the, 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 uh, that part of the... Palestinian body politic that did not accept Israel's existence, ruling, ru ruling Gaza. So the issue here was that, that completely contextualized differently the Israeli internal debate about what to do with Gaza. Because how could Israel allow, for example, a port in favor of what? An entity that's committed to Israel's destruction? Now you see, without a port and without an airport, look at the amount of, of, of weapons and ammunition that despite the lack of port and the lack of an airport, Hamas was able, was able to assemble. Now Im imagine that they could also bring all the stuff through, through a port and an airport, okay? This is, this is, this is a prism that you cannot ignore. Mm. It was there. Now, it's true, by the way, that Israel had a government f for the last 12 years that, let's put it this way, mildly, was not crazy about a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. And having a, a neighbor like Hamas 
I, here I agree, at least in part, because I don't think that that's like the, the mother of all evils. But yes, is, for, for Israelis who were arguing against the two-state solution, it was convenient to be able to point to the fact that, by the way, that not only was Hamas in, in, in um, uh, ruling Gaza, but all efforts to reconciliate Hamas and, and, and the PA have failed. Arab countries, one after the other, tried to play a role in internal Palestinian reconciliation, and all of these efforts failed. So, so now we go back to the, to the general conditions that, 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 don't, that, that, are not, that don't answer the question of specifics, because I do think that actually, again, you had some of the answers already, including the issue of the, of the Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement that was almost there. Mm. But I think the Saudi-Israeli normalization that was almost there was part of a much bigger phenomena. And the bigger phenomena was f Palestinian fatigue. Mm. Everybody was tired of the Palestinians. Everybody was tired of the Palestinian problem, and so on and so forth. So before we had this normalization, we had two Arab states that signed agreements in the framework of the Abraham Accords with Israel that dropped the conditionalities of the previous Arab Peace Initiative and basically signed the agreements with Israel without any reference to the Palestinian issue. Yeah. And, and, and that was after we, Israel already had peace, uh, peace treaties with Jordan and with Egypt that lasted for decades without the conditionalities of something. So what, have, what, would, what do I learn from all of this? I learn from all of this is that if you neglect the Palestinian issue, it's going to blow in your face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and So we have to remember, we have, we have, the, we have the, general, the general environment that, that, that was the environment for this kind of disaster happening and what I call the match. Yeah. Okay, the, the Saudi Peace Initiative may have been a match. It's exactly the same of what happened in the beginning of the, of the second Palestinian Intifada. The conditions, which is to say the failure to, to make any progress in Israeli-Palestinian peace, was all there, okay? And what you needed is then uh, Israeli leader, uh, Sharon, at that time in the, in, the, in the opposition, going up to Temple Mount, which is, of course, a hypersensitive yes. issue. Yes. He, he supplied the match. Yes, yes. But, but he didn't create the, the general environment. Okay, so I want to I want to you know move to, to another set of questions, but before we get off this, I want to present to Amani and then to David just some some um, uh, uh, narratives that I think were embedded in Shai's answer. So so w w what do you say, Dr. Amani, to somebody who says, "Look, Gaza hasn't been occupied by Israel since 2007. Hamas could have made Five. Gaza in 2005 could have made it into a Singapore." They didn't. And that, and instead, what did they do? They invested in uh, rockets that they could lob at Israel. Isn't that a pretty good uh, uh, illustration of what this movement is about? Yeah, well, so let me sort of break down a few things. Yeah. I, 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 just give me, I didn't talk as long as everybody else, so just give me some, <laughs> some, some breathing in here. Well, 100%. Uh, so, first of all, I want to talk about. But, but you were much better than us. I know, well, I mean, go. <laughs> The siege, right? I mean, the logic behind the siege is basically a security argument for Israel. I think that argument has fallen on its face. You can, the siege can last. It can be economically strangling. Those weapons are still coming in. Those missiles. We're seeing in Gaza things that were beyond the imagination, right? Drones, paragliders, whatever. I mean, I'm not, I never studied war and the bombs or oil. I'm like civic engagement, democratization type of person. But what we're seeing, for somebody who studied Palestinian civil society, we've never seen this level of sophisticated weaponry and missiles and launchers everywhere and tank things that blow up tanks. Um, so the siege is not working. So then the question is, why is this population of 2.2 million people, 2.3 million people, under economic siege? You cannot develop Gaza into a Dubai or Singapore under the conditions of the siege. So that's first. And we can come mm -hmm. back and talk about this in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about two other things, uh, just in terms of keeping the debate going. The West Bank. I'm from the West Bank. And in 1989, we, the Palestinians, we denounced terrorism. We recognized the state of Israel. And we entered into a peace process that should have resulted in a two-state solution. The Palestinian Authority was created to honor that peace agreement. Fast forward, 
almost quarter of a century later, on the West Bank, we had, at the eve of Oslo, we had 100,000 settlers on the West Bank. Today, we have 750,000. At a population of 2.5 million, about a third of the population on the West Bank right now are Israeli settlers that are armed. You know, I just talked to my mom, and she's like, Mom, the settlers are just coming around and destroying everybody's homes mm. in the Palestinian territories. So while, and, I, and people say Israel, Israel, I just, you know, as, as somebody has always heard people say, oh, all the Muslims and all the Palestinians, no. The Benjamin Netanyahu government, we had an Israeli left mm -hmm. and an Israeli peace camp that worked with the Palestinians to advance the Oslo Accords. So it's not all of Israel. Mm -hmm. And Shai is one of them on the Israeli side. It is Benjamin Netanyahu. I, I was, I'm nostalgic for the peace, uh, peace process. And I was watching Shattered Dreams, you know, the, about the failure of the talks the other day. It's online, it's free, watch it. The, one of the common features in that documentary about the destruction of the peace process is Benjamin Netanyahu since 2002 coming to the stage and basically saying, we don't want peace with the Palestinians. We can accomplish our goals on the West Bank, give, you know, give, give them Area A, which are like little enclaves, and we can expand the set, set, set settlements on the West Bank. As a Palestinian, when I go home every summer, I'll tell you the West Bank has shrunk. If you haven't been to the West Bank, it's probably not the best time to go now, but look at the satellite imagery. So it, when, when we even want to even, you know, you sort of say Hamas, Hamas did not denounce terrorism, did not recognize Israel. Like, what, has anybody, like, what Hamas has done repeatedly is make fun of the Palestinian Authority as like the losers and the sellouts and the weaklings because they did what the international community asked them to do, the civilized thing, which is recognize Israel, denounce terrorism, demilitarize, and still nothing. Hmm. Who in, in, the, in the U, let's just forget about Israel right now, and, and there's an Israeli left that has also been sort of pushed aside by what's going on. We, we have a leader in Israel who is trying to reverse democracy so that people cannot really express their opinions. There are protests in Tel Aviv by Israelis calling for a uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to step down, but also the end of the, mm. the atrocities in Gaza. So this is much more complicated. It's not like, oh, we're black and white here or, or here and there. There was a peace camp of Israelis and Palestinians working together that was sabotaged by the right wings on both. Hamas on the one hand, but with all due respect, the right wing Netanyahu coalition right now that is calling for the eradication of Arabs from the West Bank in Gaza is also sort of not recognizing Palestinians' right to exist, Palestinian human rights, Palestinians' rights to stay on the land. We're in a moment in our history, when you ask about how we got to October 7th, look who's, who's dominating the, 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 the conflict. Now back to the West Bank. Mm. Mahmoud Abbas, we have not seen Palestinian elections since 2006. Why? Because there's this fear that Mahmoud Abbas will lose. That is another authoritarian mm. government. There were negotiations to bring in Hamas into the fold of the Palestinian uh, Authority where it would have to honor the agreements of the Palestinian Authority. Khalid didn't mention this part, which means that they would have to subscribe to denouncing terrorism and recognizing Israel de facto by participating in the Palestinian Authority coalition. Is this correct? Or uh, there was yeah, willingness yeah. for them to to be subsumed under that Palestinian Authority agreement. Hmm. We can come back to the details of that. Yeah. But that did not move forward because Mahmoud Abbas did not want to include Hamas, which also talks about the lack of Palestinian elections and authoritarianism. But finally, this idea that everybody was fatigued about the Palestinian cause. I think Arab leaders are fatigued, Arab authoritarian leaders. But there was no intifada, there was no conflict when the World Cup was held in Qatar this summer, or sorry, last winter, mm. um, all of a sudden, we saw things, all of a sudden, Morocco would score a goal and the crowds would step up and start singing for Palestine. There was no conflict. Any Arab country that, that, that played well, the crowd would step up and start chanting for Palestine. It was basically on a world stage where authoritarian governments 
weren't limiting what citizens can say and talk about. There's a lot, our public opinion polls have shown consecutively that there's a lot of support for the Palestinian cause. Finally, and think about October 7th. Let's go back to the West Bank for a moment. This whole, whole idea, what, what, like, and I'm not for right or wrong, I'm just trying to contextualize what's going on. The attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque preceding the, these events, day in and day out, there's attacks by Israelis and Israeli settlers, by, by Israeli military and Israeli settlers on Palestinians praying on the temple, uh, 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 yeah. al-Haram al-Sharif yes. in, in Jerusalem, over and over repeatedly, and, 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 and harassing Palestinians, and this has been ongoing, this was part of the culmination. Mm. Again, a West Bank that did everything that the world asked it to do. Right? Everything. And who is, the, who is calling for a Palestinian state on the West Bank? Just last point. Everybody has to say this, talk no, no, I'm please. not going to get a chance to talk. Everybody talks about the failure of the peace process. <laughs> You'll definitely get a chance to talk. I just want to say this last thing. Everybody yeah. talks about the failure of the peace process. I want to tell you, everybody in this audience, because I don't want our youth to be delusioned by our leaderships. There was so much progress made between Palestinians and Israelis in the peace talk. Not enough, but there was a lot. It's much better than where, we're, where we are now. You had joint security. You had joint intelligence sharing. You had joint patrols. You had mm. joint economic agreements. You had uh, agree imports and exports, mm. borders. There was a lot of work being done behind the scenes, and my colleagues all know this. They were, uh, I was younger, I was a, I was, they were the hope. <laughs> they were giving us the hope of the future. And then they came to Camp David, they couldn't finalize the deal over some, some important details around Jerusalem, and then everybody said, oh, peace failed. It did not fail. It needed another few more rounds. Yeah. And nobody came back to bring those groups back together. Which U.S. administration since then? Yes, Obama tried a little bit here, but, but, but even with the Biden administration, now they're calling for two, two states. But has, have, has any American administration seriously been committed mm. to the project of giving Palestinians dignity and self-determination on the West Bank? Uh, that's an, an important question that we should we should all talk about, David. I, you know, so I want to note two things. I have seven more minutes for the part of this where we get to talk, and uh, mm -hmm. I have seventeen more questions, which I will not ask. But, um, David, I want to get you to respond to something that appeared both in uh, Shai's answer and in uh, uh, Amani's answer, which is really that we have to blame, or uh, there has to be a reckoning with the conduct of the Netanyahu government that um, may have uh, kept Hamas in power. So there, there was a story in Haaretz um, by Adam Raz la last month. He says, for 14 years, Netanyahu's policy was to keep Hamas in power. And he reports that in 2019, Hamas said to a group of Likud MPs, whoever opposes a Palestinian state must support delivery of funds to Gaza because maintaining separation between the PA and the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza will prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. So how, what's your response to that narrative? Uh, the, you got to give me two minutes. I'll give you two minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, no, no, because yeah, okay. no, yeah. Amani and I see things differently. And I'd yeah. say with respect, I'm someone who I think is devoted my professional life. I want a two-state solution. I want dignity for both sides. Yeah. Where I think the narratives are gonna diverge, and I think it's important that people understand to add to your layer of complexity uh, and to make it challenging for these students who are listening and trying to absorb this, is for the United States, there were three mega efforts to end this conflict, not to uh, manage it, not stabilize it, end it. And it was Clinton at Camp David, in the six months of 2000, there was an effort of Condoleezza Rice in 2007 and 8, and there was an effort I was a part of in the Obama administration under Secretary of State Kerry, mm. where we devoted nine months to a lot of these details. And I think that if you don't understand how the U.S. wanted to end the conflict and had the Israeli governments with us, by the way, in this regard, then you're missing it. We lost the Israeli peace camp not because they fell out of the wrong side of the bed, but between 2000 and 2004, 
the intifadas where you had over 100 suicide bombs. And by the way, Palestinians were but killed David, too. David, if I may, if I may, if I may, but that was 20 years ago. No, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Yeah, ma 20 just, years, I'm that's just, two decades. I'm not, I'm, we it have doesn't to end there. No, no, okay. I agree. But I'm saying was where we lost the peace camp, where the train went off the rails, was they said, look, Ehud Barak and all the Clinton, these were efforts to end this conflict. And then you had over uh, all these suicide bombings, and the peace camp was never revived after four years of an, a second mm. intifada. The intifada was devastating. But we kept trying anyway. We kept trying anyway. And that's why the effort of Kandi Rice, 38 rounds with, with, with Olmert and Abbas. And then the effort we in the Obama administration tried of nine months on trying to solve what we call final status issues, the four issues. And, you know, I remember Abbas, March 17, 2014, you know, I'll never forget this day for the rest of my life because he promised our president, President Obama, I'll get you an answer. I know you've, mm. you've worked very hard on this, Mr. President. Give me a week. I'll get mm. back to you. All right? And so it's not exactly accurate. We never got an answer to mm. any of this. The problem with Bibi was yes. with 2019, and I'm sorry to all these dates because this is not ancient history, 2019. What you had was... They're much younger than we are. Okay, so, they're yeah, younger. Okay. But in 2019, basically, the U.N. working with the Qataris and the Egyptians and the United States and Israel was trying to say, look, nobody is offering money to, these, to Gaza. Here, the Qataris are willing to do it. $30 million. It's going for food stamps for the U.N. World Food Program. It's going for a power plant. It's going for fuel. These were substantive efforts. And it was mm. also based on a reassessment mm. that was going on in Israeli intelligence agencies and was going on at the White House and at the State Department that says maybe Hamas has taken a hard edge off of ideology. Let's get workers in there uh, to go into Israel. Let's bring money into Gaza. Let's try to see if we could use more carrots, less sticks, something that would take an edge off the ideology. Because where I think Khalil and I might have a respectful disagreement is, for me, the rejectionism of Hamas was not a detail, it was at, at the core. I mean, when, when, when basically you have Marzouk going on Russian TV saying, I don't have to build shelters, that's not my job, I build tunnels for our fighters. Or, you know, Chia going to the New York Times this month saying, our job, we didn't do this for economics, we don't accept Israel under any borders. So, I mean, there's a real problem of the rejectionism. It is at the center. They're not trying to get a two-state, a mini-state, that was the hope, that was the assumption of the last several years that economics could have an impact. And sadly, a lot of the workers that went in were the people that gave details on where to massacre people. Hmm. It's such a t terrible tragedy. And I'm not saying they were all Hamas agents. I'm saying maybe Hamas squeezed these 17,000 workers. Hmm. Here, this one is children, this has cats, this has dogs, the kids live in this room, kill here. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was a very difficult thing. Is Bibi absolved? No, he's not absolved. That's mm. also part of the reality. But there was an effort after four rounds of 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2021 of active fighting of Hamas. There was an active effort to see maybe economics could somehow jumpstart yeah. this. Yeah. And then you have the BB factor from 2019 where he said, you know what, let some of it come in suitcases. Because he was facing an election, there were four elections in a row, yeah. and he was using that moment to try to buy quiet from Hamas. And there's where I blame him, because I think there, the, the UN food program idea then got diverted in the suitcases directly for Hamas. Is Bibi the root cause of this? No way. No way. He's 5% of this. But it's a 5% that has to be fixed, yeah. and it's a 5% that has to be addressed to give hope for two states when this war is over so we have dignity for both sides. So I, I want to take questions from the audience, but I wanted to get to the second part of tonight's uh, uh, agenda, which is to talk about ways out. Okay, so we are now facing uh, a humanitarian crisis of extraordinary proportions. Um, what is happening in Gaza right now, uh, by some accounts, if you believe the Gazan Ministry of Health, um, you know, it's by, by at least their measure, more Gazan civilians have been killed in the last six weeks than uh, Ukrainian civilians have been killed since February 2022. I know people can argue about that number. Nobody will argue that uh, a lot of people are not, a lot of civilians are not dying. So the question is, how do we get out of this? And I guess for you, Shai Feldman, I would ask, um, 
What, what, is, what does success look like for the Netanyahu government in this, in this campaign? And then what ideas do we have for how we get out of this? In 30 seconds. <laughs> so the Netanyahu government is very, very, very clear about what its objectives in now are. And it's one, the first one is eradicating Hamas's fighting capab capability and governing capacity. That's one. And B is, is, is freeing the 239 hostages that, Israel, that Hamas is still holding. These are the two objectives of this operation. What does it mean now for the next weeks or so? Uh, I don't know. Because uh, we are getting into, uh, the more successful the IDF is in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, the more the dilemmas are going to, Israel will have to, big dilemmas to, to, to face in, with respect to what, we, what Israel does in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. Because the population of Gaza is, in any case, one of the most dense in the world. And now, essentially, it's become even more dense. Uh, but, again, you know, Israel suffered, Israel suffered a catastrophic event on October 7. It's not going to get out of Gaza before it meets, it, 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 it produces a response mm. to this catastrophic event. I think people, even the younger people here, may remember that after 9-11, the U.S. went to the other side of the world and invaded two countries because, because you faced Al-Qaeda, who was basically butchering American civilians in, 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 uh, in New York City. And, uh, and by the way, what the Second Intifada didn't do to the peace camp, October 7 did to the peace camp, okay? Because all the communities... All the communities in the south were people who actually were part of the Israeli peace camp, okay, and they were butchered. So we have to remember that. There's no, there's no going away from October 7, okay? And we are still in, in what we call the event. We are still in the event called October 7 and its aftermath. Now, the second dilemma that Israel will face, of course, is if it succeeds in its two objectives, is what does it do with the Gaza Strip? Now, my view about this is very clear. It's similar to President Biden. Israel signed with the, P the PLO the Oslo Accords. The first implementation agreement was the Gaza Strip and Jericho was given to the PLO, okay? Hamas, by the way, we forget about that. F when Hamas won the 2006 elections and the first national unity government was forged, it... The, the European Union basically presented the three preconditions. Hamas refused all of them. Not to recognize, they, they did not recognize Israel. They didn't sign any, any they were not willing to, and they were not willing to accept the agreements that the PLO signed before them, mm. okay? So this didn't start afterwards. Now, if, you, if, you, if, if Hamas, by the way, had a strategy in 2006 of wanting a Palestinian state, they had an option. And the option was, because remember, that when Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005, Israel withdrew not only from Gaza, but from four settlements in the northern part of the West Bank. Did that change the situation in the West Bank? No. Why did Sharon do it? To signal to the other side, this is not Gaza first and last. We will disengage from the West Bank. But for that, for that Hamas had influence on the Israeli learning curve. Yeah. And instead of saying... Okay, now let's, let's, let's teach the Israelis that they can safely withdraw, okay, and as long as we get our Palestinian state. What happened after 2005, after Israel withdrew? St the rockets started flying. What's the Israeli... Con so you can understand now, after we see what happened after Israel withdrew from, from Lebanon in, two, in 2000, in May 2000, Look at what 150,000 rockets and missiles that Hezbollah now has. And by the way, it's reminding us every day now with increasing intensity now. And Hamas, that's what it did. It, it, it reminded now what was the conclusion of the Israelis. Why did the, why did the right wing win these elections? Yeah. The right wing won the elections because the Israelis accepted the narrative that if Israel withdraws unilaterally, that's what it gets. If you didn't like the book, so, you'd hate the movie. Yeah. 
Well, no, no. Uh, uh, please. Really quick. And Hamas won because con what part of the platform was because of the failure of the peace process to produce results on the ground as well, right? So the failure. Of and the it peace also process, won because of the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. Yes. But we 100%. can't solve everybody's but, problems. But but the, but the problem is is that the failure of the peace process has emboldened both the right wing and Hamas. Yeah. So we're in October seventh, 100 percent. But this has been decades in the making. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. And if we wanted to look at that bell curve once where we had Israelis and Palestinians on the same peace path, yeah. let's look at the conditions underlying that momentum. Yeah. We, can, we can sit here and say how horrible the right wing is in Israel, how horrible Hamas is. Nobody's, I, I'm, we're not, I don't see anybody defending Hamas or the right wing. But, but what happens Thank God from for that. here on? Sorry? Thank God for that. <laughs> well, but where we go from here is going to be very instrumental. Yeah, of course. Let, let the record show, in fact, that my question about, is about where, was about where we go from here, and we immediately went back to talking about the history, which just illustrates, I think, how thorny some of this is. We will now come to the most important part of the evening, <laughs> which is uh, questions from yeah, this. Didn't get his fourth, uh... Uh, I, I'm not, we're not doing a, a, a census here. Um, <laughs> So, so, um, so uh, this is, I will, I will not be able to e e exit this uh, room with the goodwill of the audience if I do not give them a chance to ask questions. So, um, so we have two microphones here at which you are encouraged uh, to line up to ask your questions. We have exactly 18 minutes remaining for questions, and I really would like to take as many questions as possible. My little script here now has me telling you to keep your questions very brief, which is important, but I didn't add that to my panelists that we should also keep our answers uh, succinct. Um, and so um, if you feel comfortable, uh, uh, please briefly introduce yourself. You know, you can say your name, your school. Say who your question is addressed to if it's addressed to somebody. And then pose your question with the brevity and efficiency for which Harvard people are known around the world. Okay. Uh, let, let, me, let me... Obviously, we're not known for that. Um, I will... So, so what, at the Kennedy School, what I often have to do is define what a question is for people. A question, if you look up in the dictionary, what is a question? It is a statement designed to elicit information. Uh, it typically ends in a question mark. And so I would ask you, as you're standing up there and you're formulating what you're about to say, uh, make sure indeed it is a statement designed to elicit information. So if it begins with something like, this is more a comment than a question, uh, you do not have a question. So you may um, remain seated and yield to somebody who has a question. And if you have a three-part question, and all of you do because you're brilliant, of course, um, you just ask one part so that your colleagues uh, can also ask their questions and that we, so that we can give our guests a chance to answer. And so I will start uh, with this person over here. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you all for uh, coming and speaking with us. When I listen to the panel, I hear about two societies and two, at least two state actors in those societies that don't recognize the legitimacy of the other society. And Dr. Jamal, you talked about that within these societies, there are many who want to live together. We have a two-phase process, first to remove the obstacle of those who don't acknowledge the legitimacy of the other. How do we do that? Who should we look to? And how should we, from here, what should we learn to support the uh, people who want to come together and want to remove of the obstacles. Right. Th thank you so much. Answer really quickly, succinctly. You are the students of Harvard. You are the future. Um, can you tell me how many peace groups are on campus? Mm. Okay, mm. There's, that's where you, you guys are going to be influencing policy. You yeah. guys need to start talking about peace and bringing peace. This, this is what the two-state solution in Oslo started with conversations. Palestinians sneaking into Israel to meet with Israeli in Israeli homes and Israelis sneaking into the West Bank to meet in Palestinian homes. You guys don't have to sneak around here. You have free speech, number one. Number two, about eliminating the other. This is about strategy. So right, one argument will say, let's just keep dropping bombs. I will say, my opinion is based on sort of setting this conflict. If violence was going to solve this conflict, it would have been solved by now. Mm. Violence breeds violence. What I would rather see are policies 
and effort and a Palestinian authority if we could get elections where efforts that basically make the message of peace and reconciliation far more attractive, right, than any other message. On the Israeli side, I want to see, also would like to see in Israel where the benefits of peace are far more advantageous than the eradication of the Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza. And where does this start? This starts really, you know, it starts with A, people seeing tangible changes on the ground, but also political leaders to step up and basically sanction their leaders when they're espousing violence and, and vitriol and hatred and the dehumanization of the other. We, as we, and I've said this over and over, we, we have been victims of this conflict since we were born. Mm. We, would, we, we would love to turn the page and just be able to live with peace and mm. dignity as Israelis, as Palestinians. Mm. Yeah. Tremendous. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take a question here. Hey, uh, first of all, thank you all, thank you all for uh, coming here today. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I do want to start with a short comment. Um, please, please, my been... friend. We're almost out of time, so yeah, no comments. Just a question. Okay, just a question. So there have been um, some statements on this stage tonight uh, equating uh, Hamas with the Netanyahu government, which I didn't, I didn't vote for, right? Hamas with the um, Netanyahu government. But uh, my question is this. So the State Department of the U.S. classifies Hamas as a terrorist organization and the Netanyahu government as an ally. Do you think they're making a terrible mistake? And that's for so I w I Jamal and I won't disagree with you. Hamas is a terrorist Zerist. organization. I'm not, I'm not defending, yeah, nobody's yeah. defending Hamas. I'm just saying that you have a right-wing government in Israel that is also calling for the eradication of Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. So that, that, I'm not saying they're equitable. Yeah. Hamas is a terrorist group. Let's not debate about that. But, yeah. Yeah. but you can't have a ruling coalition that's talking, that, that, that has people advocating for the killing of Arabs. On yeah. the West Bank and Gaza as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Can, David, yes, yeah, quickly. I just yes. want to say really briefly, and I, something Shai alluded to at the very end that I, I, I was worried got lost. People say, how did the, the Likud come to power? And I think it's very important to understand. Are there a minority of these settlers, by the way, uh, uh, but a, a violent minority that should be thwarted? And I, I worry about it igniting the West Bank, and I think you and I see that very right. similarly, Amani. Right. But let's be clear, the reason why the Likud that got only 12 seats in 2006 came to power is because the public lost faith in the basic equation that we all want, which is if you withdraw, you're more secure, you're not more vulnerable. If we had rockets coming from downtown Boston on Cambridge and we couldn't solve this, we would not get the peace process people to, to succeed, okay? The camp of people in America that, I, that I'm very with, the, the equation has to be, if you withdraw, you're more secure. Mm. You're not more vulnerable. The Likud has won because people don't believe in the equation. They mm. think we're do-gooders from Harvard University mm. or something who really don't understand the harsh reality that Hamas will fire rockets because they are rejectionists, they don't accept Israel the size of a telephone booth on a Tel Aviv beach. But you don't have Hamas on the West Bank. First of all, Hamas West Bank did not join. Hamas Gaza has been calling for Hamas West Bank to join them, my, and they have not. My point is, is Amani, you know this. No, 2005, uh, when I Israel will, pulled out. No, no, we had, we had, we had the right wing radicals right. who did suicide. I'm not going to argue about the history. I, but I am, I am going to disagree with you, David, as a colleague, and I'm worried. I'll be honest with you, when our policymakers are saying it's a fait accompli, there was this moment in peace and we're never going back to no. it because you had these suicide bombers no. who, who we denounce yeah. as terrorists. I, and the, the sto I story is the that, opposite. No, no, I, you want to contextualize right wing extremism in Israel, but, but, but you don't want to then understand then how this also contributed to the, the extremists in Palestine. What I'm trying to say. We need now leaders to say our youth. Of course. Fifty percent of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza were not born before, uh, were born after the 2006 elections. We keep saying the 2006 elections. Fifty percent were born after that election. Let's give the children of Israel and Palestine a better future. I, Let's get over. Yes, we, let, let, I agree. Okay, so, we agree on that. But we don't but want everybody. Saying, everybody keeps saying, "Well, we did everything." And no, they no, did, no. They I did, said they we got to keep trying for two states. Yes. We should never give up because we want dignity for both. 
but we just have to realize that we should not demonize uh, half of the Israeli public. No, we're not demonizing. Okay. No, no, no. We're demonizing. Is it legitimate to say that people in the Israeli coalition okay. government? Yes, those the moderator is losing control of this panel. Okay. Of the <laughs> okay, the moderator is losing control of this okay. panel, okay. and he okay. would sorry, like to sorry, reassert sorry. it. Okay. Um, okay, this is. But this is this is gr a great debate. It's and I would love it to keep happening. It's just I want to uh, get. To as many questions Khalil as has we not can. Said <laughs> I know. <laughs> Khalil, I'm shy. Um, okay, please. P Thank you all for your Brief time. Uh, my name is Adam Schneider. I'm a joint degree law and uh, Kennedy School student. Uh, so after this war ends and uh, the dust settles, and God willingly soon, uh, there's going to be another push for peace. Uh, Israel will hold elections and almost certainly will have new leadership. But I think there's a real question of legitimacy right now for Palestinian Authority leadership coming to those, you know future peace negotiations. You know, Abbas in the 18th year of a four-year term, yeah. he doesn't have much legitimacy outside of Ramallah. What st steps can the international community take to help restore PA legitimacy? And if there's an election, how do we address concerns that a repeat of 06 won't happen? Yep. Uh, and a group like Hamas or worse could come to power. That's a great question. I'd love Khalil uh, to, to address that. <laughs> Um, who told you um, Abbas's legitimacy in Ramallah? That's news to me. <laughs> he certainly does not have legitimacy anywhere. The survey that we have done uh, that uh, Amani referred to in the West Bank showed 85% of West Bankers wa wanting, demanding his resignation. Only 6% of West Bankers were willing to re-elect him if elections are held today. There is no doubt that we need a national unity government for the Palestinians right now, one that can stabilize conditions both in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, and can prepare for elections. And in the meanwhile, we need to see a strong leadership from this country and from the major Arab countries, particularly those that have made peace with Israel, to come up with a plan for a two-state solution that the two sides can embrace one that will respect the needs of both sides and will respect everything, all the progress that has already been made. In that context, I can't see anyone calling for violence being able to win in Palestinian elections. Palestinians will vote for Hamas only if they think that diplomacy and negotiations are not viable and that the only way for them to end the Israeli occupation is through violence if we can convince them that is not the case, I can't see them voting for Hamas. I can't see that problem arising to begin with. Nonetheless, uh, if Hamas is to win, this is democracy. We have to accept that. In Israel, Israel has now the most extreme government that is thinking about bombing uh, Gaza uh, out of this world and annexing the entire West Bank. And we're okay with that. But if Hamas wins, we're not okay with that. That's uh, certainly we need, if we want to be real Democrats, we have to accept if Hamas wins. Hmm. Nonetheless, if we look at the history, the surveys that I've been doing throughout all these years have always indicated every time the Palestinians thought that there was a viable diplomatic path to a two-state solution that would end the Israeli occupation, they voted for those Palestinians who supported democracy and supported negotiations and a two-state solution. They only voted for Hamas when they thought that there was absolutely no way forward through uh, uh, diplomacy and negotiations. Shai, I want to take the opportunity of the uh, gentleman's question, his mention of the international community to come to you and ask you, what role do you see the international community, the Arab countries, the United States playing in trying to get us out of the immediate catastrophe that we're in right now? No one's going to get you out of the immediate catastrophe. The issue is, what, what, what would the day after look like? And I do think that, uh, again, I think we have to go back to first principles. The first principle was Israel signed an agreement with the Palestinian Liberation Organization after Israel regarded that organization for decades mm. as a terrorist organization. But it recognized the fact that the PLO went through certain changes and became a partner and 
Even Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, when uh, it one, uh, right at the end of one of those negotiation episodes called the White River negotiations in 98, there was a ceremony in the White House and Prime Minister Netanyahu called Arafat my partner. So the issue now is, okay, so we, let's go back to principles. Mm. Israel agreed that to hand the Palestinians gradually control over the Palestinian territories. The PLO was, was decided by the Arab League in 1974 as the only legitimate voice of the Palestinian people. Okay, now what does it take? Something very bad happened to the PA through these years, as Khalil is better than anybody to describe what, what happened there, okay? So they're, they're, they can't take over right now. They can't take over because they're not legitimate and because they have no power. So the issue is, is it possible for, again, a coalition of countries that have some kind of a track record mm. in relations with Israel, whether it's Egypt and Jordan and the four Abraham Accords countries and Saudi Arabia that was almost on the verge of normalization, to say, okay, we, for a certain period, we do two things. Number one, we take over Gaza. And number two, we, we, will, we will fill the shopping list of what does it take to strengthen the PA hmm. with an agreed upon timetable, after which there'll be elections, they'll elect their leaders, and so on and so forth. I want to say only one more thing about what does it take, because I think we're kind of a little bit diverted. Uh, we, we are now faced with a, an, a disaster, the dimensions of which we have not seen since 1948. It's a disaster on the Israeli side, it's a catastrophic, it's a catastrophe on the Palestinian side, in Gaza. Now, I see, and that goes back to the first of the questions that was asked, when it said, well, what, what, what can happen now? I, ca I can see, because Israel, again, with all, its, with all the, the criticism that can be leveled against Israeli policy and Israeli leaders and so on and so forth, I, I can tell you that I, I can, I can I'll, I'll, I'll race with anybody in this auditorium mm. as to, in, 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 the, in, the, in the sport of criticizing the Israeli government. But there is, but, but there is one, there, there is one virtue, and I call it a virtue, of the Israeli political system. Is, Israel is, not, is, is an unforgiving country to itself. Mm. Every time it faced a catastrophe, it, the biggest one uh, of this dimension was the 73 surprise, it nominates a national commission of inquiry, and, and if you look just the second Lebanon war in 2006, the national commission of inquiry basically sacked the, the political leadership was finished and they sacked all the top echelons of the IDF for its malperformance. What will happen now, parallel to what can save Gaza, is after the, the, in, the, in the day after, there will be a major, major reckoning on the Israeli side because, mm -hmm. because Israel has never, ever forgave. Now, you see, the, th the, the problem is this. We, we, and I say we, is Israelis and Palestinians, and especially we is Israel and Gaza or Hamas. We, sh we, we both arrived at this catastrophe. I can see a process in Israel where people, and that was the, the, vir the real virtue, the real virtue was not fire people who were named as liable or mm. as to be blamed and so on and so forth. The real reckoning is to go back and re-examine your assumptions that led to a policy that led to the catastrophe. I have much more, com I have confidence that Israel will go through this because it has, it's almost a national sport. Yeah. I wish I could be, I could be that optimistic about the Palestinians going through a similar reckoning and asking themselves, okay, but you know, but this Israeli army that, that, that came into Gaza and started leveling uh, neighborhoods in Gaza, they didn't do it all these years. Why did they do it? Maybe we had something, we, which is to say we Palestinians, maybe we Hamas, had something to, 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 to some responsibility in this. It didn't come out of all way. Because, you see, the problem is usually is that, and that's the way some Europeans, other Arab countries, sometimes treat Europeans, treat, treat Palestinians as if they have no agency. If I were a Palestinian, I would be infuriated by this because it, it, it's, it's almost the Palestinians are children 
that, that you only talk to grown-ups and you don't expect anything from the children? Why? So I, I think that, again, the, my answer to the first of the questions, which was critical, is both sides have to face the fact that they both contributed to this catastrophe. And they have to, they have to it's not a matter of, oh, we'll get rid of Abbas and we'll get rid of Bibi. No, no. It's the question of what was the assumptions that led to Israeli policy? What led to the, to the Palestinians to, to behave the way they... And, and here again, look, the, the, the Palestinians have a, have, have a lot... To, to, to reckon with, because, and, and forget about what happened on October 7. Four Arab countries that, were not, that didn't sign peace treaties until then signed peace treaties with Israel without, and, and set the Palestinians aside. The Saudis themselves were that. It, it can't be that the Palestinians can just complain about the Arab countries as having abandoned them, betrayed them, stabbed them back in the back. Yeah. Palestinians have to, at one point, sit down and say, how did we contribute to this happening? I mean, Jamel, I, I see, saw you nodding when he said that what's needed is self-criticism on both sides. 100 percent. I mean, I, I, we're not, I think we, we've never come here to say that Palestinians have never done anything wrong in the history or what Hamas did was right. And if, we're, if, if you think, with all due respect, that Israelis are infuriated, we're very infuriated about what Hamas did. We knew right away that Gaza was going to get pummeled. This was a dis discussion, a conversation. But these children in Gaza, again, half of them who weren't born uh, when, when Hamas was elected, right? They are victims of this conflict, which is where we begin with. We're all victims of this conflict. There needs to be a lot of self-reflection. Um, and I hope that if we if we're, can move beyond, hopefully, October 7th, uh, and, 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 and like Shai said, that that moment is very catastrophic, when we get to the table, we have to allow the younger voices uh, and their dreams and aspirations some room, because if we're stuck on the past and talk about 2002 and 2004 and 2006, the, those narratives can be battled out. Yeah. But there needs to be sort of, but we need to, we need to be working together as communities. Yeah. This is great. I, I'm, it's now we're two minutes over. One thing that everybody in this hall has learned that you never put an Egyptian in charge of anything that requires timekeeping. Um, <laughs> I just want to first uh, thank our panelists because you really modeled for us what vigorous um, uh, debate about important issues, but that comes from a place of goodwill looks like. So thank you for that. And, and I want to thank... I want to thank uh, Dean Detar and, and Dean Mugford and the Business School for uh, making this space available for us to have this debate. And I really want to thank you, uh, the audience, for your fantastic questions and for modeling, really, that this is a place that is founded on reason and fearless inquiry. So thank you all. Good night. <laughs>